There you go. Everybody heard it. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us at the uh, Burke's Bards um, first Thursday uh, reading and uh, our virtual poetry reading and um, an open mic. So this month we are delighted to have Dr. Robert Philman. He's the author of the chapbook, uh, November Weather Spell uh, under Main Street Rag uh, from 2019. Uh, he has been a finalist for the Gerald Cable Book Award, the Ron Rash Award in Poetry and the Cider Press Review Book Award. Um, his recent poems have appeared in such journals as the Holland's Critic, uh, Patterson Literary Review, Poet Lore, Salamander, Spoon River Poetry Review, and Tar River Poetry, all great publications. Um, and in the past, he served as the advisor to Lehigh University's literary journal, uh, Amar Amaranth. He also organized Lehigh's monthly spoken word forum, after my heart. Mm -hmm the uh, Drowned Writers series. Um, and he currently serves on the advisory board for Poetry in Transit, an award-winning program founded at King's College that publishes poems throughout Luzerne County's transit system. Um, Dr. Mm. Philman earned his PhD in English from Lehigh University in 2019, where he was also a mountaintop creative writing fellow. He now teaches at Cutstown University, where he is a member of the English and professional writing departments. So thank you so much, uh, Robert. I know you're about sick of me doing the Dr. Philman thing. So, <laughs> so, so, so I, 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 gave, I gave you a, a break there. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us. And, um, and we um, we, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the mic over to you and uh, we'll come back afterwards, everyone and do our open mic. And then we'll come back and ask uh, Robert a few questions and have him send us off into the evening. So Robert, you have the mic. All right. Thank you uh, for that very warm introduction. Uh, I just, you know, want to take a moment to thank Burks Bards for inviting me to read tonight and for arranging this event and doing so much to promote it. I'm uh, really excited to be reading some of my poems and uh, I'm looking forward also to the open mic afterwards. So thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, uh, as, as she mentioned, I, I will be reading poems tonight from, from my chapbook, November Weather Spell, uh, which was published in, in 2019, uh, just before the, the entire world uh, seemed <laughs> to fall into disarray. Uh, it's only been a couple of years, but 2019 uh, seems like forever ago, I think we can probably agree. Uh, Anyway, I'd, I'd like to begin uh, the reading with a narrative poem from the chapbook called uh, Some Elsie. Uh, and in the book, the, the poem has an epigraph from uh, William Carlos Williams uh, and his poem to Elsie. Elsie being uh, Williams's housekeeper and also the subject of, of his much more famous poem. Uh, so I'm thinking about uh, that poem uh, when he says, no one to witness and adjust, no one to drive the car. Uh, I'm thinking about that sentiment uh, as I'm thinking about Elsie, who is the, the vehicle in this poem. They spread knees, invited her to sit, counted the seconds until they could feel the cold charms of her sparkling bracelets brushing against their rough skin. Cradling her in their arms like an old guitar, they strummed her hair to the silken phrase that curled at her neck. Music only she could hear, off key, always worthy of a smile. At 15, rumors groped her the way fruit flies float around a picnic table at dusk when the food has been left out. Big boys, old enough to act like men, brought her pretty things, flaunted her, except one night when everyone was gathered around a tire swing, paying no mind as they loafed, telling the tobacco juice stories she was never meant to hear. Wherever she went, it might as well be a thousand miles from here, stalled along some road as dusk settles into night. Mm -hmm. 
And um, this next poem on the, the adjacent page, conveniently, um, it's, it's an ekphrastic poem. And I really like ekphrastic poetry. Uh, some people hate it. Um, but with ekphrasis, uh, the goal is, is to write a poem about uh, a piece of art uh, and to tell the story you know, in a different medium. And the challenge to writing one is that uh, the ekphrastic poem needs to uh, stand on its own where the reader doesn't need to see the original piece of artwork in order to appreciate or, or get meaning from the poem. Uh, so this ekphrastic uh, poem is called Housebird and it's based on a, a pretty haunting painting by the American realist painter, uh, Andrew Wyeth uh, from Bucks County. Um, and his painting is called Bird in the House. Uh, so in this, in this poem, I'm trying to imagine the subtext of, of that painting. Um, and one thing I'll say before I start reading, you know, Wyeth, uh, you know, often used a very limited palette, uh, very muted colors. He, he was known for creating these very stark scenes. Uh, and uh, this, this painting, Bird in the House, you see that. You see these muted colors. You see everything is very understated. Um, but there's this cast of light uh, on this bird that has entered the home. And it's sitting atop the fireplace. And, and that bird becomes the focal point. Uh, and so this is called House Bird. The evening light dislodged it from its perch, shot it straight through an open window, stone gray stopped on the mantle. How quiet the bird became. It might be straining silver or pulling the summer's edge from its beak, which tastes of goldenrod and zinnia seeds and mud. Hardly anyone can tell if it's confused or afraid. It is settled in the light of the sun, the way you'd listen politely to your best friend who's promised to read your poem, a heartbeat of disbelief rattling against dumb luck. Shadows cringe in its presence, the potted fern disappears. It's the leaning bird we want to apprehend. It doesn't seem convinced it's not alive. And, um, and, and with that, that poem, you know, there's, there's the also in my mind that, that superstition, right, of, of a bird getting into the house and, and it carrying a kind of uh, omen with it. Uh, so I'm playing with that, that superstition there and, uh, and, and continuing with the theme of, of omens or superstitions. This, this next poem is called Superstition, uh, things that we, uh, we hear in passing and, and we don't really believe and yet we don't necessarily want to take the chance and have the thing turn out to be true. Uh, when I was growing up, my, my mother was always very concerned about uh, using water in the home if there was a, a thunderstorm, if there was lightning. And I remember not being uh, allowed to shower or wash my hands or like turn on a faucet because of this fear that, you know, you could get electrocuted. Um, you could get struck by lightning. Um, and and that, that concern, that fear, um, no matter how remote, uh, you know, it's still, it's still there, right? And so it's the, the basis for this next poem, which is called Superstition. Don't bathe in a thunderstorm, my mother would say. Lightning can strike. I think of this as I watch from the tub, each flash a split second closer to my wife tapping on the door, jimmying the lock when she gets no answer, finding me dead body still warm and soft against the white porcelain. But nothing ever happens, and I do not want to go. Not yet, not while water rolls down the curves of my shoulders and beads, not without raising my hands in prayer, not until I can pull back the curtain, satisfied that I am clean. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and uh, this, that previous poem was, was inspired by my mother, and uh, this next one was, was inspired by my dad. Uh, for years, uh, my father was a carpenter and an in-home remodeler, and he specialized in uh, flooring installation of, of all types. Uh, so carpet, ceramic tile, linoleum, hardwood, uh, you, know, you name it, uh, and, and he installed it. And I remember as a kid, um, he was always on job sites. He was always uh, working in, in other people's homes. And uh, I remember seeing him you know, painstakingly work in, in our own home and how much he, he cared about uh, craft and the need to, to do things the right way. 
uh, the value of, of just doing even the smallest job with uh, the utmost care. Uh, and this, this poem tries to, uh, to honor that, uh, that kind of craftsmanship. So this is called uh, The Installer. Surrounded by odd angles, my father kneels in faded, torn blue jeans in the middle of a stranger's living room. He is not resting. He is composing a concerto, his yellow pencil leveled on his ear, the tip whittled to a blunt point. Sitting there, dust in his eyebrows, forehead sweaty and dirty, arms tired, he contemplates what he'll do next, now that he's discovered nearly an entire carton of tile was delivered chit. Imperfection all around. He lays out the tiles in rows, his fingers roughened by them. He marks each one, readies them for the wet saw. Holding back his breath, he feeds tiles slowly toward the steel like musical notes on a staff. Covered in bone-like powder, his fingers let the blade do the singing. Each misfit from that broken pile, he'll fit naturally like the grace notes in a Chopin nocturne. In his head, he is pacing on the clean, newly laid floor, every angle accounted for, each tile cut in pure lines, no sharp edges, the wet grout drying, his tools packed up in their metal case, the sweat of his forehead wiped with the same rag he had used to buff out a single small flaw he noticed on the glaze. Um, so, so that, uh, that last poem was uh, about my father. Uh, and this, this poem that I'm going to read next is also, it's a little bit about him, um, but I think it's, it's also about me uh, being a parent myself. I have two uh, wonderful children, uh, my daughter Emma and uh, my son Robert. And, and this poem, I think, um, is in some ways nostalgic. Uh, it's, uh, in some ways, it's about my shortcomings as, as a parent. Uh, in some ways, it is about uh, what you can pick up on, what you learn inadvertently, uh, even in the seemingly most mundane occurrence, uh, something like, like getting a haircut. Uh, so this is called Learning uh, to be Still. After Miss Kayla snips the last stray hairs from my son's forehead, sprays him with watermelon mist, dusts him with glitter, as if she were his fairy godmother. I think of haircuts my dad used to give in the kitchen on Union Street. How he draped an old sheet across my shoulders, told me to sit still because I wouldn't stop twitching my nose or kicking my legs. How my bangs were always uneven for school pictures. I remember the time he drew blood when he nicked my neck with the clippers, the scuff of his knuckles trembling against my cheek as he cleaned up behind my ear, how we tenderly dabbed the red with a cool rag, saying he was sorry, which froze me stiff. Then Miss Kayla says she is done, swivels him on the chair so he giggles. She shows him his new look in the mirror and brings her face down close to his, making him squirm even more. So what do you think, she asks, and I don't have the heart to tell her it's wrong, all wrong. And my dad really did neck my neck with a razor one time, right? He did, and it, and it did bleed, and it, and it did tell me, uh, it did uh, make me sit still, which, which I think has helped me as a writer, has helped me to sort of be still myself. Um, this, this next poem that I'd like to read, uh, you know, as you can probably tell by now, I tend to write about domestic circumstances fairly often. Uh, I like to put people uh, on display in, in my poems. Uh, and I like to write narratives. Uh, I, I will very often draw on, on experiences uh, from my own life. And, and so much about poetry, I think has to be autobiographical. But uh, I'm also you know, not afraid to let my ima imagination 
explore, right? To, to alter details, to change the players. And I think that, you know, as writers, we have to, right? We have to have the freedom to tell the story in a way that makes the world of the poem more interesting and, and the experience more true. Uh, so, so this poem is, is called Dumping Leaves. It's also uh, from the chat book. And it refers to a relative of mine, my Aunt Mimi, and she is featured in this poem. But this story is not Aunt Mimi's, right? This is someone else's story. Uh, and this is, uh, this is called Dumping Leaves. My Aunt Mimi dumped six barrels of leaves off a cliff by her house, because at 91, who cares about fine for littering signs or the 250 bucks they could never collect from her, stares from her neighbors she hardly knew. That day, the alley was her grave, a gray rut of gravel between her backyard and December sky. Each trip a testament to her belief that she would never die. In her mind, the scrape of plastic on pavement was her daughter's voice sharply warning, one fall and I will put you in a home. But she just kept hauling, one barrel at a time, listening for the swish of leaves like a breathless sigh. And finally, the long, slow silence that rang in her bones when she stopped. It's for my Aunt Mimi. Uh, so I'd like to move outside of, of the chat book, uh, if I can, for, for a couple poems. Uh, you know, November Weather Spell has, has 26 poems in it, and I find myself reading uh, selections from that grouping pretty often. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, the book's about two years old at this point. So I've written a ton of, of newer poems since then, which, which I'm aching to share. Uh, and this poem that I'm gonna read next was recently published in, in the spring issue of The Night Heron Barks, uh, which is a really wonderful online literary journal. Um, it's just a, a beautifully curated magazine. Uh, and every poem is paired with a, a really visually striking piece of artwork. Um, there's usually a link of the poet reading the poem. Um, and, and each issue has sort of little subtle thematic uh, connections, you know, throughout. So it's just a really great journal. So please check out The Night Heron Barks um, if, you, if you wish. And this next poem I'm going to read uh, just came out in the spring issue. And, and since it's baseball season, uh, I think it's appropriate. So um, this is called uh, The Batter. One pitch a little too high and inside. Bobby Smeagol, who had been on the losing end of it, both on the field and at home, mulling the sting of that rubber ball, so much like his father's belt, smacking the backs of his thighs. How he couldn't duck out of the way. How boys laughed at his squeals as he writhed on the ground in pain. It took no more than seconds for him to snap. All of that hurt from Bobby's heart channeled into that bat, exploding with a single swat against a tree, which could have been one of us on his knees, begging for his life. The others all watching in horror what might have been, as rumor has it, one barrel later exchanged for another. But back then, we couldn't have known how close Bobby was to his final out. And uh, I, th I think I'll read just, just one more, if I may. Um, you know, I've, I've been told in the past that I don't have many uh, quote unquote uh, nice poems that I tend to dwell uh, on, on maybe darker, more uh, unpleasant uh, things. Uh, but I wanted to end on something nice, uh, something kind of up, uh, uplifting. Uh, so earlier I read a poem about my son, Robert, uh, and I feel it's only fitting that, that I read one also inspired by my daughter, Emma. Uh, and this uh, poem appeared in the, the 10th uh, anniversary uh, issue of Stone Boat, which is a journal that I just adore. Uh, it's just a consistently amazing uh, journal. And this is a poem uh, called Restoration. Last night, I took the rag to my favorite chair, first pouring the yellow avocado oil mixed with coconut onto an old shirt, then smoothing drawn out circles across the brown leather damaged by son and by daughter, 
thinking of how one day when she was very small, for no reason at all, like a kitten, she clawed her nails down the seat back, leaving a wake of tears that with each passing year seemed to split even more. In taking a paintbrush, I dabbed the umber stain into the cracks then went back to rubbing circles, this time thinking about all the minutes I've spent trying to hide what is a way back to my girl, how this ritual brings me closer to her soft baby skin, the fabric of us, then finally stopping to wipe away the excess and take one second to sniff the cloth, which suddenly smells like dried milk on a soiled bib. See, isn't that nice? So, so thanks, thanks so much for, for listening. Uh, that's that's all I have. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, you had me a William Carlos Williams, right? Like, okay, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm I'm all in, right? And then and then I remembered I was doing some stuff, and I think I saw you on Split the Rock, and I'm like, okay, now I'm like really in. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so yeah. you know, um, that was just wonderful. I loved the readings, and of course, you're right. You know, so many of us. Uh, you know, pull from our personal experiences and, you know, and our family members, we sometimes stick them in where they aren't and we sometimes, you know, do these things. So it was wonderful to hear those. So thank you so much for sharing. And um, I, um, I had, um, I did want to ask you, um, you know, the evolution that you've taken. So, you know, I know like for me, um, I tend to write a lot about ancestry and about, you know, my, my fam different family members from an ancestral standpoint, but I'm finding myself beginning to move to um, family members that um, are closer, right? That they, they, they maybe recently passed as opposed to, you know, long ago. And so I was just wondering with you, um, you know, cause you obviously you took us from the spans of your family, you know, so I was wondering, was that sort of when you were writing younger in terms of your father and your mother and those observers, and then now as a parent, has any of that changed exactly how you write, how you look at, you know, the poem and what you think about the poem? Um, you mentioned, you know, you wanted to give us nice with your daughter, but, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard other people give, you know, kids, kids poems about vomit. So I'm sort of like, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a really wonderful question. Um, you know, I think, uh, I'm not sure I have a, a really great answer for you. I think that, um, you know, I, I tend to try and write and honor uh, whatever the experience is, whatever the emotion is, whatever the event is, I try to capture that. And a lot of times you find that there is, is often a blend of, of emotions where um, it could be a really wonderful, uh, inspiring moment, but then there's that sort of twinge of, of, of regret or, or, or shame that you might feel or something, you know, for not being 100% in that moment. In the, and so I might have a poem that brings those things together, uh, or I might have a moment where I'm looking at my, my child and it draws me back to a memory of, of my, my, you know, upbringing, uh, and there's bringing those things together, right? And so I think when, I, when I'm writing, um, a lot of times I'll be writing poems about, you know, what, what seems to be a family member, it might be an uncle, it might be my parents, but a lot of times I reread the poem and I think this is actually me trying to deal with my own, my own insecurities or the things that, that you know, I may be displacing onto these other mm -hmm. people. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I find that when I first started writing, I tried to avoid writing, um, you know, what I would call like the, the quote unquote, like domestic poem. I didn't want to write about the people in my life necessarily, right. maybe to protect them or like not share, you know, what I, what mm -hmm. I, what I was thinking. Um, but, you know, after encountering poets like Len Roberts or Maria Masiotti Gillen, I mean, who, who really, you know, took that charge, um, it really made me feel a lot more comfortable doing that. Um, not necessarily comfortable sharing the poems with those individual people, okay. um, you know, but, but actually like, you know, being okay with saying like, well, this is something that I, that I felt or I've, I've seen or have experienced and, and I'm going to put it out in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And, and maybe, maybe they'll come across it at some point. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. I mean, because that's sort of, you know, I mean, you know, William Carlos, we followed, you know, Ezra Pound. And so, you know, and they were all into like, hey, let's cut this, you know, let's cut this old crap and let's get, you know, the new stuff sort of sort of rolling. So I like that. Um, you know, I can, um, we can see from your shelves that you're a reader, obviously. Um, I'm just wondering, right. Um, is there, so, so it's kind of interesting because, you know, sometimes with poets, they don't always read, you know, poetry is not necessarily their favorite genre. So mm. I'm just wondering, is it your favorite genre or, you know, do you read something else to sort of get away from it or, you know? No, no, it is, it is most certainly my favorite genre. I am, I'm pretty much obsessed uh, with, with poetry um, and, uh, and reading poetry and discovering new poets. Um, and yeah, the shelves behind me, um, I, you know, that, the one shelf that's entirely all Robert Frost up there, oh, that's all it. entirely okay. Gene Toomer. So, um, cool you know, then my contemporary poetry is back here. So, yeah. so yeah, I, I, poetry is, is my favorite genre. I, I will, um, uh, I, I, I don't ever really need a break from it. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's so great. You showed those shelves because it was so funny. I was talking to another poet friend of mine and, and she, she made me concerned because she has all of her chapbooks, um, alphabetized, like on the, on the shelf. And I had mine categorized by like, you know, types, you know, or, you know, or like, you know, what I felt like they felt. And so, so now I'm going back and I'm like, oh my God, I need to out like you know, it's like <laughs> you get you get obsessed with these with these little books, right? Wow. It's like, you know, and um, and then the last thing I'm gonna ask you, and, and we'll we'll go to the open mic after this, is um, what's it with poets in baseball? I've got some baseball poems. <laughs> you can what is it with us in baseball? It is, it is, hey, it's the it's the American pastime, it is the greatest sport, right? It is uh, you know, so so I I don't know. I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, maybe I, I should try to write a football or a basketball poem, but I think it just baseball just came natural to me. And uh -huh. um, and uh, yeah, so so yeah, I don't really have a good answer for you other than um, <laughs> then yeah, I love baseball. Um, go New York Mets. Um, I, uh -huh. Even though I you know I know that we're we're in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a huge yeah. New York Mets fan. So it's okay. My work as a Mets fan. That's interesting. So yeah, okay, okay. You know, well we're O's down in in Maryland. So um, although. I, Bernardo's on here, and so I know he's a, uh, he might be a, uh, uh, a Washington um, fan, but, um, but I, I grew up in D.C., and I, but I've always been an O's and Orioles fan, so, and, 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 and like your Mets, you know, we're, we're rebuilding at this yeah. time right now, yeah, we were, that's the, Mets like, have been, <laughs> the Mets have been rebuilding since 1962, yeah, so, no, that's, the standard, that's like the standard line, right, so, well, anyway, um, yeah, so if you can hang in with us, we um, are excited to hear you um, read us off into the evening. So at this point, guys, I'm going to open it up for the open mic. We have um, readers tonight. So um, I'm just going to go through the list really quickly um, and just remind everybody that it's um, roughly five minutes um, of reading, which gives you, you know, two to three poems. If you want to give up your read time, that's fine. You can just hit us with one um, fantastic thing and, uh, and we'll move on to the next person. So um, I'm going to I'll go ahead and um, put the list in uh, the chat. We have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We have five readers tonight. Um, I don't see, I'll look and see if I see, let me just look really quick. Um, yeah, I think, I think one of our readers wasn't able to join us this evening, so. Um, this is this is our list, and I uh, so yeah, I don't see D. I don't see D. Allen here. Alrighty, so and Patty, while you're looking, I want to uh, as a footnote to what you said, Robert. Berksbards had a baseball poetry contest for many years, and we would put the word out to people to write a poem about baseball <laughs> or something related to baseball and we got oh. wonderful wonderful submissions from all over and then we would have the the um manager of the of the local team pick the poets <laughs> oh wow that's wonderful pick the winner yeah. that's <laughs> and pretty then cool. we would invite them to come to the stadium and they would read before six thousand people wow, oh, wow. that's such fun before, that's before a game <laughs> 
Oh, wow. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. I mean, I know, uh, Robert, you've been in Poet Lore and, you know, that was probably when um, Ethelbert was, uh, Ethelbert Miller was the editor for that. And he has a whole book on, you know, baseball um, poetry. So very cool. I think we saw, the, I put the list in the chat. And so I think Vanessa is first. And um, so Vanessa, thank you so much for emailing and, um, and requesting to read. Um, and so I'm going to let you take it away. There we go. <laughs> Trying to get the unmute. Hey, Vanessa, just because, you know, we don't know if we've got one or two uh, newbies on, if you can just give us a quick, you know, one liner blurb about yourself, then that'd be great. I'm Vanessa Helms. I live in Fredericksburg, which is actually not in Berks County. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to stick with the family theme tonight that Rob started. Um, so my son, Peter, is turning 13 uh, on Saturday. And uh, Peter has Down syndrome. I've never been able to quite know how to write about that, but I have attempted it. Um, and I do feel a little nervous, which is not usual for me, but I think it feels a little personal. This is for Peter, who is the jazz of the universe. Feeling the irresistible pull of a small creek swollen with spring rains, we walk to the sandy bank where the best rocks call our names. The woods are singing their timeless song of slow heartwood in annual rings and bubbling sweet sap. In soft shaded mossy places, the furled fronds of fern have started to unwind in leaflets paired like chromosomes on slender stems. We throw in rocks, picking out the really big ones to make the biggest splash. And the creek is different where the rocks have changed the flow. At the confluence of choice and chance, our rocks create a new syncopation where the water leaps and jives as nature improvises, you laugh and symphonies of thrush and stardust hush to hear the jazz of the universe. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. And I think Marilyn, did you and Patrick want to go next? Sure, sure. Took me a minute to unmute there. Uh, and I have to continue the theme of family too. Uh, my brother has a birthday this month, so does my sister, but uh, he's getting older and, and rather infirm. So for his birthday present this year, I created a chapbook of poems that my sister and I could wrote. Um, and the cover is a picture of our taken when we were much, much younger. It was a family portrait and I used that for a cover. Uh, that was an oil painting I did a long time ago. So I'll just read the last poem in this book that I made for him and gave to him uh, last weekend. <clears throat> and it, it's about the, that future, you know, that uncertain future that we face. It's called Sidewise. I never knew how to speak about how some things happen at the corner of your eye on the edge of growing different and so I ignored it until it gawked like puberty. What did chickens think about feathers when feathers were new? 
What did we do with maturation? Squander it in the corner of the gym at a high school dance? We're living per second, per second, per second, and I can't differentiate sauntering to the mailbox. I'm sorry, I can't differentiate sauntering, yeah, sauntering to the mailbox from free fall or failure from winning the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. Altering has become the norm. What's normal next? Thank you. And Pat, I guess you're gonna read yours. Let me angle the camera a little better for you. Okay. Well, this, is, this happened a long time ago when my son moved out of the house to go to college. It's called my son's apartment. My son's moving out of the house tomorrow. He's getting his own apartment. At last, I get my library. He's getting his own apartment. We'll save a fortune on the water bill. He's getting his own apartment. My wife and I will have some privacy. He's getting his own apartment. I won't have to see him every day. He's getting his own apartment. He won't always be around to make me laugh. He's getting his own apartment. Somehow I never realized what a part meant. And uh, that was broadcast from my son's old room. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we make do with what we have. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Hey, Bernardo, are you, are you ready? Um, I was going to stick one in. Of, they, they, you guys got me going on this like family thing. And so I had this one I was going to stick in. And I know you can, you can, you can take us out. So I was just wanting to, to know, do you want me to give you a minute? Okay, cool. And it'll give us a little bit more time together too. Um, when you guys maybe think, plus I thought too, we could get a little taste of some of tomorrow, but not really, because I'm not going to do this tomorrow. But I have a poem. It's called Flower. And it's about, um, I have a great, an aunt that um, when um, all the kids were little shammy kids of her own, and when all of us were, was, were little, she taught all of us at the age of two how to cuss. And uh, that way, you know, we could we could shock our parents, right? So she tell she teach us, and then she say, "Now go out there and say it," you know. So you run out to the living room, you know, and you say, you know, shit, right? And they all, ah! all the other, you know, all the adults go crazy, right? So this is called flower, right? So, uh, Aunt Lois, I miss you. I have forgotten how to cuss like nobody is in the room. I forgot how you taught me to say shit. Heads up eyes straight ahead and the emphasis on the tea. I miss your sugar-filled pound cakes, smooth and just the right color yellow like a sunbeam. One for each of us kids, our names written in red or blue marker across the wide piece of brown tape lining the cellophane wrapped loaf, perfectly shaped. I only buy Sarah Lee brand bread. I knew it was your favorite. I remember how you would gently hold the loaf in the AMP and show me how soft it was. See, just the right amount of spring. Funny, you never bought the bread. You knew how to make your own perfect loaves. Then taking the knife and splitting the middle so the sweet cream butter drained down through the dough. I would watch you making that bread all afternoon and teaching me all about cussing. I do like where you're buried, next to the road in the churchyard at the cross streets with no stop sign. I go there to visit you sometimes at lunch and eat my Sara Lee sandwich thinking of you. After a while, some busybody blows their horn for me to cross the intersection. And I sigh slowly moving on past your grave, but not before calling them a piece of shit. Aunt Lois, I miss you. <laughs> So that's to my auntie. I couldn't resist. <laughs> I know, no, it's like cracking up. I couldn't resist because we had all these family things going, and I was like, and I've been thinking a lot, a lot about her lately for some reason. So, um, and and also when you said the bird thing, I think too, uh, Robert, it reminded me of uh, of her, and and she had these same these same things, these same superstitions, these same, you know. Everybody go to the front room, you know, you can't be by the window, you can't be, so it was interesting, so. 
All righty. Well, you guys, uh, Bernardo Taylor is with us. And um, I don't know what you're going to, to read, Bernardo, but I know it's going to be great. So I'm so looking forward to it. And thank you so much. Thank you. Did you want to tell the group a little bit about yourself? I'm not, I know some of us know, but everybody might not. I am a poet from the earth. Uh, I believe that all poets, well, for me, all poets grow in the dark. We are little seedlings that, that scribble away in the dark places where nobody else sees us writing for long periods of time until we finally share what we have. And it's like we're pushing through the earth and now we are expanding and now people are telling us how beautiful we are. And then we, we know we take it on. We're poets now, you know, so. Um, that's how I've been doing for about 50 years. So uh, I'm just, just moving on and whatever God gives me, I take it and share it with the people. You know? uh, I'm right, not going to do- You are not, the Prince George's County Poet of Excellence though. Aren't you one of I the- am I am one of those, yes. There are four just so, just so that <laughs> folks can know where to go find you, right? If they if they want to look you up, you know? <laughs> well, okay, well, uh, I will, as I, put, I can put my email in the chat, you know, when I'm going to finish. Perfect. Uh, I got two poems. Uh, they're about a minute apiece. Um, one is for another poet, a friend of mine, Maritza Rivera, who used to run this thing called uh, Mariposa. And um, I watched Mariposa grow from just a weekly reading to a poetry retreat. Beautiful thing. And um, uh, Mariposa is Spanish for butterfly. So one day this thing started to come to me, and I don't know why I was writing it, but it just showed up. Here's to Mariposa, to butterflies, that be the epitome of beautiful, inspiring, free, to leave cocoons to bloom, to loom in grand imaginations, to see a light that brings delight divine, lessons that can teach us to use time, to grow, to know who you are. Spread your wings to show, no thoughts about the stars, just freely go. Butterflies that flap wings as if they never tire. Inspire me as poet to leave cocoon, to bloom, to loom in grand imaginations, to bring forth light, delight in word divine, to shine, learn the lessons of the time, to grow, to know the one I am. Expand in heart and mind, the truth about me faced, see my life reflected like a butterfly's place. Butterfly, flutter by my window. Mm -hmm. I'm a sing song poet, by the way. Uh, I believe in music. I have lyrical style when I write because I started out wanting to be a songwriter. It took me a while to realize that songs were composed of poetry. And um, so sometimes I'll throw a song in, you know, out of, out of nowhere because that's what sings to my spirit. This piece is called IBIP. I believe in poetry. As for me, I believe in poetry. I believe in its magic. I believe in its ability to face something tragic, to place it in a place, a frame that helps us get past it. No matter how long, with power so strong, believe. Let it take you to where you belong. I believe in poetry. I believe inspiration. I believe words that come from it are no collaboration. A poet that knows this shows this in awe of its creation. The power so strong in our prayers and songs. Receive, let it take you to pastures of calm. I believe in poetry. I believe in the strength. I believe from haikus to sonnets, no matter the length. When word is served truly from the heart, you will feel the evidence in our prayers and songs like a praise or a bomb. Conceive, let it take you from darkness to dawn. Poetry knowingly enters in places the core of what grace is. So sweet its embrace is, 
So come forth and taste this. I believe in poetry. Do you? Thank you. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And yes, I believe in poetry. <laughs> You always leave you. You always leave me with like these great phrases, right? So I like you know. You just take us so deep. I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. Thank you so much. So um, yeah. So there we go. We are coming to the end of the hour, and um, we are gonna hear, I think, from Robert one last time. And we just want to thank you so much, Dr. Philman, uh, for. <laughs> for um no but for reading for us tonight we truly have enjoyed it and did everybody were were was everyone able to put something in the chat um i don't know were you able to stick some stuff in the chat um for yourself um because uh, I, I certainly can <laughs> yeah if you can drop some some things in the chat so we'll we'll leave it open for a few minutes after you um finish reading and everybody can kind of you know chat and and talk for a few minutes um, while we get stuff back into the chat. So um, thank you so much again, um, Robert. We really appreciate it. And um, please, uh, please let us know what, what you wanna share with us. Um, and I don't know if I said this before, but the Ephrastic poem that you, um, that you read on, in terms of the bird, um, that was just absolutely beautiful. And you're right, you know, we could, we could really get that visual from that. And um, I like Ephrastic poetry as well. Um, and I have to, uh, I'll have to remember that uh, we need to make sure we can see the visual with that too. So that was good. Yeah. Thank you. Reminder. So should, should I, should I go ahead? All right, excellent. So again, thank you so much um, to Burke's Bards for, for having me and thank you uh, to everyone uh, who attended and, and thank you um, for those wonderful uh, open mic readings. I'm just, I'm inspired to go to go right, uh, right now. Um, but I wanna end uh, this evening with uh, the, the last poem in, in November Weather Spell. Uh, and this poem is called uh, The Blue Hour. And uh, just, you know, when I, when I was growing up, uh, we lived in a, a three-story uh, row home um, and uh, we were a family of five and, and my father had remodeled the, the attic and one room was, was for my brother and one room was, was for me. And um, my brother's room looked out into uh, sort of like these dark trees. And then on the other side of it, I got to look out over all the, the chimney tops uh, of, of the town. Uh, and so that's sort of the inspire, uh, the, the inspiration for, for this poem. Uh, and it's called The Blue Hour. 20 years since I stood waiting by the third floor bedroom window at dusk, thinking about the ghost stories my grandfather recycled, those cold Pennsylvania days, just after we set back the clocks, gained the extra blue hour of light, that sacred time when the living and the dead can see each other. I remember the steam whirling from chimneys like hundreds of souls lured by stars, stretching their new wings beneath the moon's hollow shiver. One chance to cross over from this realm and sail into the flute song of silver light, caught between worlds for less than a second, then gone. 20 years since I swore I saw Katie Esten's older sister, 14, dead of meningitis, drift past my snow shackled rooftop, heard her song on the wind, a voice no longer torn, but fever by fever, but pink and sequined like the gown she wore to the eighth grade formal just one month before. 20 years since she smoldered past a wobbling Venus, dancing her way into the dark. Thank you, thank you. That was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, Bernardo is, is, is making comments in the chat. So everyone, thank you so much um, for this uh, June um, 
uh, edition of Burke's Bard. And I think we put in the chat, I think Elizabeth, somebody put in the chat that next month, the uh, reader will be Ruby Mora. So uh, for the July 1st reading, so please, um, first Thursday reading, so please join us back then. I will not be your host during that time. So um, we are, they are looking for a new host. This is it for me. My six month gig was up, is up. Um, but you never know, you might see me, you know, hey, you know, you might see me back here again. Um, I'd love to come back as a, as a, as a reader, so I can kind of put that out there. Um, my chat book is coming out uh, next month. It's called um, uh, St. Paul Street Provocations, and I did put a link, I think, in the chat to that. That is about the time period that I lived um, on St. Paul Street in uh, the city of Baltimore, uh, one block, uh, south of North Avenue um, in an area that um, at the time was was blighted. It's it's since gone through a bit of gentrification. But um, and and so some of my poems in there are really about about that time, that specific time period. And um, and so um, if you want to learn a little bit more about Baltimore and the homeless, um, you know, check out that. And I'm not sure when we'll when when I'll, when I'll have a reading, um, but I know it'll be coming up soon. And the publisher is Yellow Arrow Publishing. They're a group out of Baltimore um, that publish women and uh, you know feminist um, po poets. Um, so uh, so check them out. They have a wonderful um, monthly uh, online um, ma uh, lit mag that they do um, with poetry. So as well. So. Yep. So cool. And if you can join us tomorrow night, you'll hear, um, I'm going to read two pieces from that. And one is about football. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I do base, I actually do all the sports. I actually have a basketball one too. Um, <laughs> about some guys that play basketball. So, but um, all righty. Well, I'm going to cut the recording off now. Um, and thank you all again. And you guys, you guys, we can, uh, we can chat for a couple of minutes. And thank you, Patty. You're welcome.